Keep me in your prayers. As you know, last week I had the flu. I'm back, but it takes a minute to get all your strength back. And then I did something silly the other day, and then this is what I'm suffering from. I did something silly. I don't want you to do it. So I'm going to tell you what I did. And all macho guys don't do what I did. Among the things they gave me, they gave me some cough medicine to help with the cough of the flu. I got the terrible flu and all that and got through it good, right? I'm doing good. The man's doing good. Praise the Lord. But I decided to take the cough medicine. It's like these little gel caps. Now, it tells you to take the gel caps with, you know, what, 12 ounces of water? Take the gel caps and take the water, right? Take the water and take the gel caps. Well, you know me. I don't need no water. I just take the gel caps, throw them in my mouth and swallow I don't need water. Praise the Lord. So I did it. The gel caps got stuck right here. The gel caps dissolved right here. I tried my best to get them out. They wouldn't move. I drunk water. I, 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 I used the old finger trying to, and nothing worked. And oh, 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 let me, this happened uh, Wednesday night. And everything got numb. Everything. I was scared to go to sleep. I was, oh, God. And so I think what I did was I, I irritated uh, 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 area there. So I'm getting better. Uh, that's why I struggled more this past Tuesday night, Thursday night, than I did last Sunday. So pray for me today, and whatever you do, when you take a jail cap, <laughs> drink the water. <laughs> Say amen. Learn, learn from me. <clears throat> amen. So, all right. Let's uh, look at our text as I try to teach uh, from this voice that's suffering from the dumb thing that I did. It says, at, at the time, Herod, the Tetrach, and we, did, we won't spend much time in review, but we did say last Thursday night that a Tetrach, that is a uh, official title. It literally means ruler of a fourth. Herod the Great had many sons. When Herod the Great died, he had his domain divided into four parts. And he talked with the Romans and got the Romans to agree to allow him to will uh, his uh, kingdom to his sons. And... Uh, uh, and his son, Herod Antipas, is the Herod of our text. He got uh, 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 one-fourth uh, part of the inheritance. And so um, Herod the Tetrach heard of the fame of Jesus. Now, the Bible says uh, about that time, this was right after Jesus had been uh, baptized of John and uh, the ministry has, start, has started and, 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 and everything uh, has exploded. Now, by the time Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, is written, John the Baptist had already been put to death. So we're going to go back and, and, and look at his life. But by the time verse 1 of Matthew 14 is written, John uh, is dead. All right? Herod thought, according to Luke's gospel, chapter 9, Herod's, many of Herod's servants and the, and, the, and the talk that was going on was uh, that this Jesus, who is working all these miracles and healing everybody and moving and doing marvelous things, that Jesus is John who have come back from the dead. Herod had said in, in Luke's gospel, how can this be since I beheaded John. I beheaded him. He can't be back. Well, Herod eventually uh, believed that, that Jesus was John uh, having returned from the dead. Uh, also, because Elizabeth, the, Mar the mother of John the Baptist, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were related, uh, tradition teaches that Jesus and John the Baptist being cousins uh, by, by, by nature, greatly resembled one another. So Herod was under the impression that John, whom he had put to death, was back after he heard of the fame of Jesus Christ. 
And our Lord avoided Herod. He avoided Herod. Herod uh, had two uh, places where he spent most of his time. One of the palaces were in Tiberias, uh, southwest, on the southwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. And the other uh, considerable fortress, which his dad built, was at uh, Macheris, and it was seven miles east of the northern tip of the Dead Sea. And Herod spent the majority of his time uh, in Tiberias. And Tiberias, interestingly enough, was in walking distance to Capernaum, walking distance to Nazareth, to Cana, to all of the areas where Jesus actually went and ministered. But as far as we know, there is no historical record that Jesus ever went to Tiberias. He avoided Herod. He didn't want to uh, uh, set Herod off prematurely. Uh, Herod was a, a wicked, wicked man. As a matter of fact, we studied the other night in Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, in verse 32, where Jesus called Herod a fox. It was, he spoke to him with, and used a derisive uh, term and called him uh, a fox. And, uh, and, and so Herod, Herod was a wicked man. He had put uh, John the Baptist to death. And let me give you an idea of how uh, hated Herod Antipas was. Herod had put into place. He had put in law. He had, he had things set up that upon the day of his death, several Jewish notables were to be put to death upon the day of his death so that the land would mourn his passing. For he knew that he was so hated that when he died, no one would shed a tear. Herod even, before he met Herodias, Herod had many wives, among his wives, Herod had had his wife, one of his wives, and some of his sons put to death. He was a uh, wicked man. He was an insecure leader. And, uh, and, uh, and, he, uh, and I, th I think he wanted to reign forever. By the time of our text, he was in his 31st or second, 32nd year of reigning. And you know how wicked this man was because when Jesus was born, remember? And, and the Magi uh, went to see Jesus. And Herod told them, this is the same Herod, some 32 years prior, said to them, bring me back word of this king who is born because I want to go and worship him. Well, Herod wanted to kill him. Amen. And, and what the, the Magi, they outsmarted him. They did not go back and report to Herod where Jesus was, and verse uh, six, 16 of Matthew's gospel, chapter 2, says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked by the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. And and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which uh, he had diligently inquired of the wise men. He said, if I can't find this child, this king who has been, has been born in Bethlehem, I'll kill every child that was born around that time. And this slaughterous, murderous, wicked act brought to pass the prophecies that was spoken, <coughs> excuse me, some 700 years prior by the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet said, in Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentations and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they were not. Moms cried. 
mothers wept. Can you hear the howling in the streets of Jerusalem as parents just wept and cried as their babies were slaughtered simply because this insecure leader, a wicked man in power, was afraid that a child would someday usurp his throne. So you can understand why the people hated him so. He even had members of the Sanhedrin killed who questioned his power and his authority. His response to those who would question him would, would be to kill them. He was a wicked leader. And this wicked man had put John the Baptist to death. But when he heard of the works of Jesus, are you following me? He thought that John had returned. The Bible says in verse 3 of our text, For Herod had laid hold on John. Let me talk to you about John the Baptist just for a, a few moments. Um, we've been preaching about him. In Matthew's Gospel chapter 3, John comes on the scene. And John begins to preach uh, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And John tells the world to repent. Let me a few little things about John the Baptist. For, for an 18-month period of time, this man, this presser, influenced the world like none other before him. His influence and his power was of course similar to that of the prophet Elijah's, but it was also similar to that of the man of God, Moses. Before uh, he was even born, let me show you, show you something. Look at Luke's gospel, chapter one. <coughs> we may go up, but I want to lay this foundation. I, I love teaching these things. I want you to know it for 18 months <clears throat> While you're getting Luke, he was in the he was in the limelight, and uh, and he and he preached the power, uh, the truth of God. Amen. Uh, John was holy. He was loyal. He was selfless and unreserved in his service to the Lord. He this man did exactly what God told him to do. He had, been in, he had been filled with the Spirit from the day he was born. And let me tell you what Gabriel said about him uh, at his birth in uh, Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 1, verse, verse, uh, verse 13. It says, And the angel said unto him, talking to John's dad, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. And thou shalt call his name John, which means Yahweh is gracious. You shall call his name John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness. And many shall rejoice at his birth. Look at this. And he shall be great. Now listen to me now. In the sight of the Lord, he shall be great in the sight of of the Lord. He shall be great in the sight of the Lord. It doesn't say that he will always be great in the sight of people. Nor does it say that he will always be great in his own sight. But he shall always be great in the sight of the Lord. That will matter to you more in just a few minutes. He shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall neither drink wine nor strong drink. That is, he will join two other men in Scripture who were, that the Scripture tells us, were lifelong Nazarites. The Nazarite vow was the highest vow that a Jewish man could take in terms of living a holy life. Samuel the prophet was a life long Nazarite. 
Samson, the strong man, was a lifelong Nazarite. And John was the third man to be, to be a lifelong Nazarite. The Nazarites never drank wine. The Nazarites never cut their hair. The Nazarites could never touch a dead body. To, to live the life of a Nazarite, you had to live in the highest order of holiness. It says, he shall neither drink wine nor strong drink and shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his birth. And look at his mission. And many children, many of the children of Israel shall be turned to the Lord their God. And he shall go forth before, and he shall go before him, in, that is before the Lord, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is what the Lord said about what Gabriel said about John's life and for 18 months John this man who probably had never spent one night indoors hey fellas he was the ultimate man's man John the Baptist was and was the outdoorsy and, uh, and John was different. John was different. He was different in his appearance. He was different in his delivery. And he was loyal to the Lord his God and loyal to his message. And for 18 months, I keep emphasizing this, he never wavered. He preached with power and authority and, uh, and, and God watched over him and looked out, uh, out for him and he told the people, I am not the Messiah. I am not him, but there cometh one after me who is mightier than I and said, he will fill you with the Holy Ghost, baptize you with the Holy Ghost and, uh, and that with Fire. As a matter of fact, John the Baptist baptized Jesus Christ. What a life this man led. And listen, people came from the Jordan. People came from the lands round about. People came from everywhere to hear this man preach the gospel of the kingdom. And Gabriel said that he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. But it is, isn't, it, isn't it amazing that life has to be lived? Life has strange twists and turns. Praise the Lord. This is why to serve the Lord requires commitment. And it requires being able to trust God. Because Christianity many times have been improperly presented. Many Christians believe that when you give your heart to the Lord, tragedies won't come your way anymore. Or that, you know, all of your children are going to grow up and be the best ever. That your marriage cannot fail and that sickness cannot come your way. One of the things that make many in the Word of Faith movement teach total, one of the most, the, the, uh, most erroneous doctrines is this notion of walking in divine health. They all walk in divine health till they get sick. Preach that they're going to live until the rapture come, until they die. Oh yeah. And, and have you to believe that, uh, that, that nothing bad can happen. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, whom the angel Gabriel said, shall be great in the sight of the Lord, who had the limelight. I know I'm being redundant. For 18 months, 
found himself locked in a dungeon. The dungeon was more than likely in the palace of, at Machuris. The palace sat up on a beautiful mountain, but beneath the palace, down deep in the earth, is where the dungeon had been hewed out. The dungeon was dark. It was dank. There was no fresh air. And listen to this. It had no natural light. John was chained to the wall in that dungeon. Keep in mind some of the things I told you about it. An outdoorsman. A man who probably had never spent a night in a house. Man who was loyal to God. A man who preached with power and authority. A man who enjoyed the limelight for 18 months. Now finds himself chained to a wall that he could barely see. In a dank, damp, smelly dungeon. Locked up. And he had broken no laws. Nor committed any crime. Are you with me? What got him in trouble was that he applied pressure. It is believed that Herod Antipas, after hearing John and hearing the, the, about the miracles of John and seeing the response of the people to John and how people's lives were being changed by the literal thousands, people being baptized, people confessing their sins, people, wherever John went, the people showed up for a, a, a set period of time. Herod marveled at John's power and influence. Reminds me of Simon the sorcerer who thought that he could buy the Holy Ghost. Oh my, the world, the world, the world is always fascinated by a man of God, by an anointed person who can speak God's truth with power and authority and whom to whom people will hear. Praise the Lord. They, uh, John was the man. So Herod invited John to his palace. John the Baptist went to the palace, the palace of Herod. And he walked in. And Herod had invited him to perform a miracle. He wanted John to be his jester. He wanted John to entertain him. Yes, he wanted John to perform. I'm so glad that John is not like Christians are today. For had John been a modern day preacher, he would have walked into Herod's court and thanked Herod for his ministry. Celebrated Herod and told Herod that he wants to be, uh, he wants Herod's autograph. He probably would have tried to have sang on Herod's album. Oh yeah, he would have wanted, he, he would have been like some of the others I'm going to talk to you about in a minute who would have tried to curry favor with Herod. Oh, it's sickening today 
the, the Christians who are enamored by wicked people. You find yourself on an elevator with a movie star or somebody, and there you go shaking and quaking like they have some power. They have no power. And some of these people, they take themselves far too seriously. You earn a living pretending to be who you are not. Reading someone else's script. Go on somewhere and sit down. Live immoral life. They can't stay married to save their lives. Won't do right. Will do anything with anybody. And then try to moralize the rest of us. The devil is a liar. I tell you what, NBC learned something after they spent billions on the Olympics and they pushed for a theme, all them homosexuals out there are on the ice skating and kissing each other. Ratings down 24%. People didn't watch. Praise the Lord. Pray, hallelujah. People didn't watch. See, don't let Hollywood fool you. They, they are trying to make you think that everybody has caved and everybody's lost their mind. No, 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 no. There are people, there are people, there are people. Same thing with the latest, well, I don't know if it was the Grammys, Golden Globe or whatever, but when they had it, they slammed the Christians, they slammed the president, they slammed the right, they slammed everything, and, and turns out lowest ratings ever. People just turn that stuff off. People turn away from that because people know better. You don't like my talk today. When John walked in, John noticed that Herodias was sitting there. He looked at Herod and he looked at his wife. And he looked at Herod. And he looked at that woman sitting there. And John knew that that woman sitting there was Herod's brother's wife. Whom Herod, praise the Lord, uh, went on a trip to Rome. Went to Rome to visit Philip. Philip was actually called Herod Philip. So Herod Antipas went to Rome to visit his brother Philip and saw Philip's wife Herodias. And Herod Antipas wooed Herodias and took her away from her husband Herod's brother. Now, you know that's messed up. I mean, who wants their brother's wife? I mean, something wrong with you. you screwed up big time when you want your sister-in-law. Uh, well, I feel something. Every time I see it, yeah, I tell you, I'm, I'm, let me define what you feel. The devil. That's what I, that's the devil. That's that's the devil. That's the devil. That's your own flesh and blood. That's the devil. Say amen. amen. And uh, and so and he made his move. At that time, Herod Antipas had a little more power than Philip, and he made his move, and 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 Herod was mad. He's married to another woman. So when he and Herodias, I can't get an amen, got together, then they both divorced their spouses, then married each other. Matthew writes about it 58 to 68 years after the fact. And when he wrote about it, the Holy Ghost still wouldn't let Matthew refer to Herodias as Herod's wife. 68 years later, the text says he, she was his brother Philip's wife. I told him Thursday night that the Bible is not politically correct. 
The Bible calls people what they are. The Bible will never call a transgendered man a woman. Because that's a man standing there. If you don't believe me, just, 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 just swab his mouth. Okay, well, it doesn't matter what he have on. Pumps, stockings, girdle, wig, fake boobs. I don't care what. Doesn't matter what he had cut off. Doesn't matter what he had removed. That's a man. The word we used to use was freak. Which is still apropos. Political correctness makes us say other things. And then, oh, ain't nothing as bad as a woman trying to cross over and be a man. Oh, Lord, boy, it's just pathetic. <clears throat> trying to hang around like you're one of the boys. You're not one of the boys. You're a girl. Share, share still misses her daughter. Her no what is it, chance. They fall out to this day. She misses her daughter. Because the girl uh, uh, tried to become a man. But you know what Cher, Cher knows? She knows she gave birth to. And, and you can't change that. And so God, and God made, here I go, two kinds. God made the male and God made them female. Well, what about the hermaphrodite? Oh, you're talking about that less than 1% of people who are born with a physical birth defect. That's what that is, a birth defect. All you gotta do is just wait, study the child, that happens, and, and make the proper correction. Praise the Lord. People are born with all kinds of birth yes, defects. That don't mean there's, there's a third sex. That's, that's the devil. Oh, some of you are looking at me like, no, he didn't. Yes, I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I'm telling you the truth. <coughs> so John walks in, and back to John, and uh, he looks. And instead of putting on a show, doing a performance, praise the Lord, working a miracle. John says, it's not lawful. Uh, uh, Herod, it is not lawful. I know you're a killer. I know what you did 32 years ago with all those babies while trying to kill Jesus. I know what you did to the Sanhedrin who dared stand against your authority. I know you killed one of your wives and I know you put some of your sons to death. I know you are an insecure, wicked man, but I'm not going to play the game and entertain you. I'm going to tell you the truth. It is not lawful. For you to have your brother Philip's wife. Oh, Herod said, no, he didn't. Herodias got all hot and bothered and upset. Makeup started running. She started sweating. And oh, she's mad. She's insulted. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? Doing the deed don't insult people, but telling them about their behavior insults them. A person can shack up and feel good about shacking, but they get mad when you tell them that shacking is wrong, but they know it's wrong. You already know it's wrong. The new sin in America today is not to be a sexual pervert, it's to preach against sexual perversion. It's to tell the pervert that he's a pervert. You pervert you, then when you call them a pervert, they get mad, but they're perverts. It wasn't unlawful when John said it, it was unlawful when they did it.
Saul. They locked him up. But they proved something in locking him up. They proved that you don't get rid of sin. And you don't get rid of conviction for sin just by getting rid of the person who told you that you were in sin. See, you're going to hear my voice. You're going to hear this voice. This is an unforgettable voice. You're going to hear this voice from now on unless you get saved and do right. You're going to be, if you don't get saved, you're going to be in hell. Say, ah, Wooden told me. I can hear him now. You can't. That's, see, that, that's the power of preaching. When they, when Stephen preached, they killed Stephen. Saul was instrumental in their killing Stephen. Saul gave them permission to kill Stephen. They laid their bloody clothes at Saul's feet when they killed Stephen. But, 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 when Jesus met Saul on the road to Damascus, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the prick. Other words, you keep hearing what Stephen said over and over and over, even though Stephen is dead and gone. That gospel. Hey, 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 hey. The gospel is the power of God under salvation. I feel my help. Good God Almighty. So, so this is why, this is another reason why he thought John was back. He was convicted by what John said. Isn't it a strange, isn't it amazing how, let me go up a little higher, how the Lord suffered his servant to suffer this. Life can be so unfair. Bible says in Ecclesiastes, sometimes it happens, excuse me, sometimes it happens to the righteous that which should happen to the unrighteous. Sometimes it happeneth to the unjust. That should happen to the just. Sometimes bad things happen. Happens to good people. Sometimes God allows the faithful to suffer. Some things. And John reminded me of the story of a king that they had locked into a castle. That was a window in, in that cell. Locked him in a cell. There was a window, a window in there. But the window was too high for any man to look out of the window standing. The king eventually died. They took his body out. In that cell, there were two indented impressions in those stone walls. The indented impressions came from the king jumping, up, leaping up, grabbing the window ledge, pulling himself up to see out. He could look for a few minutes, as he, a few seconds as he held his body weight there at those lush green meadows that he would never again traverse. See a land that he would never touch. Are you with me? Amen. To the point that he put an indent in the wall. Here is John, the ultimate outdoorsman, locked up, loyal. He was so committed to his mission that he never took time to have a family of his own. There's no record that he got married. He would have been a great dad, didn't have children. Served the Lord with that kind of loyalty. Now he's in jail. Let's, let's add a little more uh, to it. See, Yeah. While in jail, he was, he was in there for a year, Jesus failed to visit him. 
Can I get a witness? The crowds are gone. Seemed like it was another world eons ago. The crowds are gone. The fresh air of the wilderness, gone. The wide open spaces, gone. Hallelujah. Everything that he enjoyed about living, gone. Went from being this man who couldn't be bound to a prisoner chained to a wall. Restricted in his actions. Could eat only if someone else fed him. This powerful man. God's man. In this predicament. So you understand now why in Matthew's gospel chapter 11. It says, and it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples. He departed thence to teach and to preach uh, in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prisons the works of Christ, he sent his disciples to Jesus and said, are you the one that should come or do we look for another? Now remember, this is the same John who introduced Jesus to the world as the Lamb of God. You can understand it. You can understand why he was discouraged. Have you ever been discouraged? I have. You can understand why going through he could have second thoughts. But let me just say this today to somebody who uh, life has taken a turn and you're going through. Teresa, you know what you're about. Let me just say this. Gabriel's words still held true. Even while John was locked up, he was still great in the sight of the Lord. Even when the crowd had stopped coming to see him, he was still great in the sight of the Lord. And even when his mind told him, look at where life has taken you. Look at how your ministry has faltered. Look at the disaster that you're in right now. He was still great in the sight of the Lord. How can this be? For God doesn't see as man sees. Praise the Lord. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. And the Lord knows the way that we take. And the Lord knows the way that he takes us. And some of you right now, the Lord has you in your prison. And things aren't going the way you expected them to go. But you stay with the Lord because that doesn't mean that you're not still great. In the sight of the Lord, I might not look like anything to my neighbor. I may not look like anybody to my friends, but I look at your neighbor and say, "Still great in the sight of the Lord." Mm-hmm. Trouble has broken out. Got a little weak. Thank you, Jesus. Money got funny. Change got strange. Half took a die. Look at somebody and say, still great in the sight of the Lord. See, if you just stay on track, if you just serve him and go through anyhow, you just tell the Lord, Lord, I'll wait right here. I'll serve you anyhow. Even though you may be down in the eyes of men, that doesn't mean that you're not precious in the sight of the Lord. Now, now, how do I know that John was still great in the sight of the Lord? How I know? I know because Jesus said he was. I heard in the same conversation in Matthew's gospel, chapter 11, after they asked, are you the one that should come? 
or do we look for another? Let me wrap this up. I heard him when he said, you go tell John how good God, uh, the blind, uh, received their sight. Go tell John that the lame walk and the lepers are cleansed. Tell John how the deaf hear and the dead are raised up. Tell John and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And then tell him, blessed is every man who is not offended in me. Saints, I, I don't want you to be mad with God. Do you want to be blessed? You just tell him thank you for where you are right now. Don't be upset because you're dealing with a malady in your body. Don't be upset because right now you're going through. Don't be upset because mama's sick. Don't be upset because things didn't work out the way you wanted them to. Just tell the Lord, Lord, I'm not offended, but I trust your leadership. I trust your guidance because you are a mighty good leader. I want to tap somebody today. Let Jesus lead you. Ah, let Jesus let him lead you for he's a mighty good leader he will lead you from earth to glory but in leading us he's gonna lead us from one height to the other but everybody's got to go through the valleys of the shadows of death everybody's got to go through their testing time but you got to trust him even when you're going through lift your hands and shout yeah yeah but i still hadn't made my point let me prove it to you after jesus said this uh -huh. and as john's disciples departed jesus said to the multitude when you went to hear john preach what did you go forth to see did you go forth to see a reed shaken in the wind other words did you go see a vacillating preacher did you go see a preacher who would compromise his views he said, no, John wasn't like that. He preached the same message all the time. And then I heard him when he asked them, he said, what did you go to see when you went out to see John preach? Did you go see a preacher who was wearing soft raiment? You see, the king wore bright colors. And the, praise the Lord, the scribes wore dark colors and drab colors. So the scribes turned in their drab dark colors and they put on bright colors so that they could get favor with the king and so that the world would not criticize them for the way that they were dressing. So they would, they buy like preachers today who are trying to be hip. So we preach the gospel now without a necktie. We preach the gospel now in jeans. We show up in t-shirts trying to be just like the world. John the Baptist was just the opposite. He said in trying to, rather than trying to dress up like, Her like Herod, let me put on camel's hair. Let me put on a leather girdle and let me eat a strange diet because I want to stand out from the world. Some of us are trying to blend in with the world. John didn't blend in. He stood out. So Jesus said when you went to see John, you didn't see a vacillating preacher. You didn't see a worldly preacher. Then he said, did you go to see a prophet? He said, well, I'll tell you this about John. He was more than a prophet. Why the word prophet? For God had shut up heaven and there had not been a prophet for 400 years. But when John the Baptist came, he was the first prophet in 400 years to come on the scene. And Jesus said this about John. He said, of men born 
of a woman there have not risen a greater than John the Baptist well at the time he said that about John John was in jail John was locked up and yet Jesus said in his current state he's still the greatest man who has ever been born somebody today you're going through you're not as strong as you were and the devil has been talking to you well today I want to give you ammunition I want to give you something to fight back you tell the devil I may be down but I'm still God's man I'm still God's woman I may be struggling but his power is still with me and I'm going to make it yes I am matter of fact right here and now I want you to stop where you are and just begin to glorify him for his healing your body for his bringing you out for he's setting things straight praise him right now yeah ah! go on and give him praise in here give him praise <laughs> Tell that person next to you that you may not be able to look at me and tell it just by looking at me. But I am somebody in Christ. And when God gets through with me, what did the songwriter say? Please be patient with me. For God is not through with me yet but oh when God gets through with me I'm gonna come forth as pure gold yeah 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 somebody ought to praise him today somebody ought to clap their hands somebody ought to give him glory because we're great in the sight of the Lord we're great in the sight of the Lord. Maybe not great in our mother's sight. Maybe not great in our friend's sight. But I'm great in the sight of the Lord. Do you believe today? Do you believe it? If you believe it, thank God for his greatness. Thank God for your anointing. Come on, praise him. Praise him now. Magnify him now. Yeah! For 18 months of dedicated preaching and then for constantly for 18 months of applying pressure to society and people coming out getting saved, people coming out getting baptized and then standing before the king and ultimately paying the ultimate sacrifice. I'll talk to you about Herodias and Salome later. Here we are. 2,000 and 18 years later still talking and still preaching and still carrying on all over the world on any given Sunday all over the world somebody's preaching about John the Baptist. <laughs> 2,000 1,800 years later. Praise the Lord. A, there are movements that bear his name. Baptist church. Full gospel Baptist. Free will Baptist. <laughs> Baptist this and Baptist that. Everybody who's born again wants to be baptized. Fathers name their sons 
John. Good God Almighty. You don't hear what I'm saying. 18 months. Oh, you don't know what you're doing and what you're contributing when you obey God. And when you as a presser apply pressure to, to the times in which we live by saying what God says and by doing what God says. Say what you will of me. Say what you will of me. But it, it, it blesses me. It blesses me to no end in this day and time as wicked as the world is to see all of whether they want to or not all the news agencies all of them got to cover the death <coughs> of a preacher Franklin said I asked my dad I asked my dad dad what do you want on your headstone? What do you want to be said about you? He said to his son, put on my headstone, Billy Graham, preacher. <laughs> Impacted the world. Set movements ablaze at CPAC. The president didn't just refer to him as a great American or a leader, but he said, a preacher. When you obey God, when you obey God, you say what God says. You leave your ministry and your career in God's hands. Let the Lord handle those things. You just do what he says. And in your moments of discouragement and feeling like you got to do something and feeling like, <coughs> excuse me, you're being looked over and passed over and stuff like that, just know John's been there. Ignore those things. Just do what he tells you. And the Lord will do the rest. I want to pray for some pressers today. I want to pray for some folk who are in a place right now that you don't like. Hallelujah. Things didn't quite turn out at this point the way you expected. Glory. The enemy has tried to talk to you, uproot you, dislocate you, break your spirit, discourage you. Hey, shake out a bullseye. Devil, whispering in your ear that God haven't done you right. Your mama didn't, your daddy didn't, your friends didn't. Nobody understands you. Is he the one that should come or do we look for another? Heavy load on your shoulders. Come. Sometimes you look around and you see people getting blessings that you've been waiting for. You even heard the Spirit of the Lord speak to your heart and say you're next, only to see next go to someone else. God knows where you are. John's been there. And the truth is, everyone in Christ who have served the Lord for any length of time, we can tell you about those times. And sometimes when you feel dejected the most and overlooked the most and passed over the most, you're at that point closest to your breakthrough. And that's when the enemy really comes in 
because he wants to get you out of place before God does what God's going to do. Can you imagine the loneliness that John had experienced? Can you imagine the brokenness? And waiting on his cousin, waiting for Jesus. Surely he's going to visit today. Surely today will be the day. I can feel it in my spirit. He's coming today. Didn't come that day. Well, he'll be here tomorrow. He just got busy. He's coming. He knows where I am. He knows who I am. He knows that I introduced him to the world. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows me. He's God. He knows everything. Surely he will come to see me. He didn't come. didn't come but if we could talk to John the Baptist today John would tell us I'm glad that he didn't come I'm glad that the Lord handled me the way that he did I'm glad for everything that he allowed I'm glad that he didn't listen to me. I'm glad that he didn't take my set of plans. I'm glad that he did it the way that he did it. Glory to God. And you too will be glad that you didn't stop. Being A presser. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. Bless his name.